You're listening to the number one Bible prophecy podcast on the web. Your watchman on the wall. Prophecies of the End Times Radio Ministry. There has never been, since the creation of Adam and Eve, a more epic convergence of Bible prophecy unfold than in our generation. And now, as the world moves forward in an unprecedented fashion, leaders from around the world will proclaim with boldness, peace, and security. The UN Security Council has voted on a resolution to counter Islamic State terrorists. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2015-890 please raise their hand? But just as Jesus warned the world, sudden destruction shall fall upon them as a woman in travail, and they shall not escape. Civil unrest. I've told you about civil unrest. What they have said about me, I'm a paranoid lunatic. I'm seditious. It's suffocating uh, vision, I think a suffocating vision of paranoia. Really, showing you for a year in advance, a year in advance, I told you unrest was coming to Europe and then it's coming here. I have shown you now in the last few months the actual unrest and violence in the streets of Europe. The question is not a matter of if, but when. ISIS has released a new video with images of New York City, apparently implying the Big Apple is the next target for suicide attacks. And new information points to a threat against the White House as well, right here in Washington, D.C. Alexei Yarshevsky has more from the White House. There will come deception. Nation rising against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Wars. Rumors of wars. Drought. Famines. Pestilences. Earthquakes in diverse places. And some of you shall be put into prisons and also killed for his name's sake. And now, after 2,000 years of waiting, it's all coming to pass. Jesus is coming back much sooner than you believe. The question you now must ask yourself is simply this. Do you believe? Get the facts. Find Christ and receive salvation today, right here on Prophecies of the End Times Radio Ministry. Find us on the web at www.prophesiesoftheendtimes.com. The most important decision of your life awaits you. The cross awaits you. Your time is running out. Find eternal life today by laying down your life at the cross of Jesus. And now, coming to you live from studios in Coldwater, Michigan, here is your host, evangelist and Bible prophecy teacher, Michael Parker. Once again, welcome to this edition of Prophecies of the End Times Reno Ministry. This is Mike Parker. Today we're going to be studying the events that are taking place over in the Middle East and why so many biblical scholars believe that we are now facing the facts of Bible prophecy of what is believed to be the beginning stages of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 of the Ezekiel Magog and Magog war. Some biblical scholars argue that this is not true, that uh, Psalms 83, which is a, a different set of countries, has to come first if we're going to go in the chronological order of the Bible, uh, the book of Psalms, and then, of course, the prophecy of Ezekiel. But as we see these things take place. We'll do this study, and we'll see whether or not uh, that the uh, that the countries that are of a line now uh, certainly do uh, reflect the prophecy of Ezekiel. And if this is all starting to culminate and come to pass in our generation, so we see in in chapters. Uh, if you got your Bibles, and if you don't get a Bible, uh, this is going to be relatively lengthy. Another lengthy broadcast, as I promised uh, for, uh, I'm off uh, the next seven days here. Started actually Wednesday afternoon and uh, had Thanksgiving with the family yesterday. And uh, my daughters and grandkids came over and had a great time. Hope you did too. Hope you had a good meal. And 
Of course, before we get started, I want to make sure that you folks all know that we are uh, once again accepting uh, tithes, offerings, and donations for the 2015-2016 year of our servers and our license fees for our music. Uh, we just purchased with some of the donations that you uh, and the, the tithes and offerings that you folks have been so gracious as giving a license through auto, uh, audio uh, machine, which produces some of the music and intros and uh, 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 music that we use, um, which is what you heard in the intro today. Uh, we pay license fees to buy that type of music and to be able to use it. So it doesn't come free, and so we have to purchase the license Anyway, we use the money that you folks send to us as form of tithes, offerings, and donations for new equipment, new video equipment, new uh, audio equipment if it's needed. Of course, we help out other ministries and other folks here in our area. And, of course, to help pay for the licensing, the hosting, and the automation of our uh, blog and uh, our websites. And we support our other ministries that are involved with Fire of the Holy Ghost Broadcasting Network. So make a long story short, just like I did in the last broadcast, I really hate, don't like asking for money at all, but uh, folks, here's what, here's where I don't have a dilemma with this, just asking the Lord to prick your heart, to soften your heart, and if you you feel uh, led so, and ask the Lord, you pray about it, and uh, if you feel led to make a donation or a tithe to help us reach our $2,000 goal, as of today, we're at $325, and uh, so we would like to reach that $2,000 goal hopefully by the end of the year last year you folks uh, came through with flying colors the lord led many of you some with very large donations some with just five dollars ten dollars twenty dollars whatever the lord led on your heart to give and we did meet our goal and we 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 praise uh, the lord for for giving you the opportunity to be able to do it we hope your life and your finances were blessed for doing it also just this year, we're asking again. We're doubling the amount this year to two thousand, and the reason for that, of course, is to to continue some of the other uh, uh, issues that we have uh, that we've been trying to uh, meet a financial need with. Our Roku channel is still in need of development, and also, of course, obtaining uh, the uh, upgrade on our servers for the capacity of the bandwidth. We've had so many uh, uh, people visit the websites that uh, there's a thing called throttling where there's just too many people visiting and it slows the website down. And so we're trying to expand the bandwidth, larger amount of uh, RAM in the server and larger amount of bandwidth, which costs more money per month. And uh, then we renew each and every domain every year. And uh, that's an ongoing basis as far as reimbursement is concerned. So we ask that you... Uh, we, we prayerfully consider giving a donation to our ministry. You can do so at prophecysofthendtimes.com and just look for the donation button there on the right-hand side of the screen and you can make a donation. We are not a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So what we do is that when those donations come in at the end of the year from our PayPal account, we do receive a 1099 of income and that's turned into the IRS and we do pay taxes on that income. And so... Unfortunately, the donations that you make are not taxed; de- they're not tax deductible. Uh, and of course, uh, being a five hundred one c three can have its advantages, but we just foresee down the road that many of the five hundred one c three ministries are going to be under the scrutinization of the federal government on what they preach, and we're not going to be one of them. So, with that said, let's continue. This is a study on Ezekiel's war. Now, we'll be in Ezekiel's chapters 38 and 39, and uh, I'm really going to be kind of all over the place and showing you where these names came from uh, in this study, and then, of course, we'll be drawing a uh, uh, drawing on some emails that we've received and some questions from folks and give you some answers also to that, and uh, we'll be covering um, the significance of helping establish the timing of the of the invasion of uh during the Gog and Magog wars and um showing the relevance and the importance of this and whether or not we're at that point now in speculation or in, in fact. So let's get started. Father, we'll have an opening prayer here. Father, I pray that you will open the eyes and the ears, use my mouthpiece as 
a mouthpiece to reach folks for you, for your son, Christ Jesus, for salvation. We ask, Lord, that you uh, give us a learning heart. Uh, Our eyes are open, our ears are open to hear the word and to understand what's going to be preached tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we've got we're going to have you open up to uh, in, to Ezekiel chapters 38. And we'll start the lesson here, to start the study in verses 1 and 2, of course. And so we'll begin here. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So, one of the questions has come to us in an email says, who are these guys or who are the people Gog and Magog? And so that's, that's a, that was a pretty good email question. So uh, if you look at a, on a modern map, you won't find any of these countries. So God knew that when he gave uh, this particular prophecy, of course the countries, uh, the, their names had changed and people tend to move around. So therefore um, he he, he described these people using names of uh, of groups of tribes, probably dating back to the immediate post-flood period. And so for our study of this evening, the Bible will give us two major passages to help us interpret these two verses here in Genesis chapter 10, verses 2 through 5, and stay in Ezekiel also, uh, Ezekiel chapter 27, verses 10 through 15. Here's what Genesis chapter 10, verses 2 through 5 says, the sons of Jephthah were Gomer and Magog, and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshech. Those are four that are already mentioned in Ezekiel's chapter 38 and 39, and Tyrus. And the sons of Gomer, I'm sorry, and Tyrus was mentioned in, G- in Genesis chapter 10. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Ripheth, and Tog- Togarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tar- Tarshish, Kittim, and Dadonim. By these were the coast lands of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, and after their families, and in their nations. Now, that was Genesis chapter 10, verses 2 through 5. Now, Magog refers to a people known to the Greeks as the Scythians, and they settled right up near uh, Asia Minor, and uh, originally in the approximate area of would be Armenia as known today and eventually they came to dominate all of Asia Minor now Turkey and spread eastward as far as China and the northern portion of Magog included regions that are well presently in the countries of Turkmenistan, uh, Kakistan, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, Armenia and Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan, and I butchered probably three quarters of those. <laughs> Note that while portions of Magog included providences of the former Soviet Union and part of the present day Russia, it would be of a severe stretch to say that Magog is Russia, although I believed that theory for several years and so did a lot of other people too. So the Gog and Magog war, a lot of people were believing that Russia was actually Magog. And uh, Tubal and Meshach have been identified with Tubalu and Musiki tribes that settled in Asia Minor, which is, of course, considered Turkey, who were within the Magog sphere of influence. And Togarma settled in the southeastern part of Turkey near what is now Syria. Gomer is known to historians as Gimaria of North Central Asia Minor. And it's worth noting here that uh, all the areas that I've mentioned so far are predominantly, of course, Muslim. And this will be a predominantly Muslim invasion once it takes place. Tarshish settled in a seaport area surrounding the Mediterranean, mostly in Western Europe, and became symbolic of Gentile nations along sea journey west of Israel. There is... um. Excuse me, there's archaeological evidence that tells us that, uh, of course, ships of Tarshish and 
Phoenicia traded with the North American continent before the ships of the Romans destroyed their fleets. And uh, and if you don't remember, maybe if, if you do remember, the Hebrew prophet Jonah tried to escape by catching a ship uh, to Tarshish. And if God, of course, hadn't intervened, Jonah might have spent the winter in Miami. <laughs> so let's continue reading Ezekiel 38 verses, uh, verses 3 and 4. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. Now here, it's pretty easy to tell that verses 3 and 4 tells us that the Lord, he's rather, well, he's very unhappy with somebody called Gog. And the flavor here of this passage, uh, it speaks pretty much volumes here, tells us that Gog and, and his people, the buddies he's been engaged in here, a long-standing pattern of uh, looks like pretty much of hateful behavior within the chapter toward Israel and toward the God of Israel. And therefore, the God of Israel will give these folks exactly what they want, an opportunity to invade and destroy Israel. Israel. Now, this is really something very important to understand is that, well, of course, Lord Father God is he's long suffering. But as these things begin to unfold, you know, God finally says, and because of the hateful behavioral pattern towards Israel, God finally says, okay, I'll let you have what you want. And we believe that's exactly what's beginning to take shape now. And the current conflict in the Middle East with Russia, Turkey, the other nations, beginning in their fights against ISIL. And then, of course, thus, once uh, with ISIL being defeated or ISIS being defeated, Russia can move into the Middle East and begin to, with Turkey, and begin to, uh, 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 begin to take note of how they're going to invade Israel. It seems right now that Turkey and, and Russia are pretty much at odds at each other. And we can see a lot of tension, things that are building up within the pattern of this war that's gonna, that, that will soon come to pass uh, in the Middle East. But uh, the things that we hear on the news and the things that are taking place, if they're not lining up with what's happening here in, in, in biblical prophecy and how this war is going to get started, then it's just a rumor and it's just another war just the players that are there that are going to be in the war where this finally cultivates into the Ezekiel 38 and 39 chapter war. And note that Gog, uh, be, that Gog is, uh, will be the driving force behind this conflict. And uh, he will lead the people of Magog, Meshech, and Tubal out to battle. So for someone, uh, some people have asked, they, they've said to me, you know, in emails, they say to me, well, who is Gog? And ask three Bible expositories, uh, expositors, and you'll get four answers. Uh, and the Lord addresses him as a person who operates his head, of uh, the Hebrew word Rosh, of Meshech and Tubal. Here are three of the most likely candidates for Gog. Some commentators believe that Gog is a name for the last day's dictator. And if so, then this is the final battle at the end of the Great Tribulation, sometimes called the Battle of Armageddon. Other commentators believe that Magog, Meshech, and Tubal are in Russia, and thus Gog is the leader of Russia. And advocates of this theory usually conclude that this invasion happens at the beginning of the seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week. Then a third possibility is that Gog is the leader of either Turkey or Syria, and somebody in leadership today and not the last day's dictator. And again, this would be the case if God intends this battle to launch Daniel's 70th week. So we, we break these theories down and we ask ourselves which theory is right. And at this point in our Bible study, in our lesson here, we haven't seen enough scriptural evidence to be sure. So by the end of this broadcast, you will be in a better position, I believe, to draw your own conclusions. And by the way, don't be misled by the archaic names for weapons described in verse 4, 
where it talks about horses and horsemen, armor, bucklers, shields, and swords. God is giving the prophet a word picture of a heavenly armed group of soldiers. And Ezekiel didn't have tanks and missiles and rocket launchers and airplanes in his vocabulary. He did have armor and bows and arrows and and swords. So they're really basically symbolic with what Ezekiel saw. So let's continue in Ezekiel uh, chapter 38, verses 5 through 7. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters, and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now here, Gog and Magog, which is Turkey and the surrounding Muslim countries, will not be alone in this battle. And according to these verses here in 5 through 7, Persia, which is Iran, will play a pretty prominent role in this in the invasion. And in addition, a nation called Ethiopia, most likely to be Sudan or Somalia, which, uh, which occupy a portion of ancient Ethiopia. Then you've got Libya and Gomer, other Turkish tribes in the house of Togarma of the north quarters will also participate. So you have to remember these participants as we go along in this broadcast and remember that all these areas are presently Muslim peoples and we'll be discussing them again here later throughout the broadcast. So notice that I haven't mentioned Iraq and Syria, which of course they are involved right now, Iraq being controlled by ISIS and Syria being really the hot flash point of trying to oust Bashar al-Assad and Damascus, where Isaiah chapter 17 looks like it's going to be fulfilled. And if you have observed that I have not mentioned Iraq and Syria, good for you, because uh, that is one of the oddest aspects of this account, where uh, Syria, Damascus, has been an enemy of Israel since the earliest biblical accounts that you can go back on. And in Ezekiel's day, Assyria and Babylon were the two most prominent and powerful oppressors of Israel, and both kingdoms were located in what is now, of course, modern-day Iraq. The present-day Iraqis are just as hateful toward Israel, uh, and Iraq is today, here in 2015, an ally of the United States. And as the United States gradually uh, withdrew its forces from Iraq, the Shiite majority in Iraq Uh, likely, of course, became receptive to the Shiite Caliph, which would be the last day's dictator. And then thus we see what happened is that the ISIS commanders and the the armies moved in, took the the military equipment, and where where we're at today. Syria, however, is a different matter. Syria and Iran are the two remaining key sponsors of Islamic terrorism. And now that Afghanistan and Iraq have been pretty much neutralized temporarily. Uh, We can only speculate on why Syria is not mentioned in this passage since here Syria controls Lebanon, which is ancient Tyre on Israel's northern uh, border. And invading armies would presumably need to come through both Lebanon and Syria. And so uh, uh, I can maybe see three explanations for Uh, the admission of Syria uh, from the list of invaders. Perhaps Syria is temporarily aligned with Israel at the time of the attack. Maybe this might have been a slight possibility a few years ago, but it it could be out of the question today, especially with what's going on with Bashar al-Assad and what's been taking place near the Golan Heights and the recent discovery of the oil there. Russia claiming that the oil that's been discovered belongs to Syria. Uh, So, um, you know, that's one temporary observation. Maybe uh, uh, Syria is temporarily neutralized by an invasion by here by Israel or the United States, which could be doing, could be happening now. The United States does want Bashar al-Assad out. Uh, Aleppo and Damascus have been hit heavily. Uh, this is a, has a measure pretty much of credibility since Syria is 
actively supporting terrorists and Hezbollah across the entire northern border of Israel, and it's funneling tenor, uh, terrorists and supplies across the common border with Iraq. Here not too long ago, uh, about seven years ago in October of 2008, a U.S. Special Forces team raided a site in Syria to disrupt uh, the activity that I just talked to you about here, the the uh, uh, su- supporting terrorists and Hezbollah. And another invasion by Israel, the USA, or both might even be the immediate uh, provocation for the Magog invasion. So that's a second observation or explanation why the omission of Syria in the list of invaders. And then third, perhaps God includes Syria and Lebanon as part of the invading tribal groups listed earlier. And this is perhaps the most likely probability since parts of present-day Syria and Lebanon were controlled by Magog in ancient times. So just gives you a really quick um observation there of the reason why Iraq and Syria are not mentioned as part of the invaders. And so and for additional insight here, you should also be aware that many of the nations mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 are also mentioned in Ezekiel chapters 27, which speaks of the destruction of Lebanon, which is Tyre. Some portions are particularly relevant to this discussion that we're having now in this broadcast, Uh, particularly Ezekiel chapter 27, verses 10 through 15, says this, They of Persia and of Lud and of Put were in thine army, thy men of war. They hanged the shield and helmet in thee. They set forth thy comeliness. The men of Arvad with thine army were upon thy walls round about, and the Gamediums were in in thy towers. They hanged their shields upon thy walls round about and have made thy beauty perfect. Tarshishus was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kind of riches with silver, iron, tin, and lead they traded in thy fairs. Javan, Tubal, and Meshech, they were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. They of the house of Togamar. Togarma traded in, the, in thy fairs with horses and horsemen and mules. The men of the Didan were thy merchants. Many isles were the merchandise of thine hand. They brought thee for a present horns of ivory and ebony. So in this passage, really, if you didn't get it, is a pretty eerie parallel to the destruction of Babylon described in Revelation chapter 17. So here raises the possibility that Ezekiel chapter 27 has a parallel application and to the destruction of the Muslim nations described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and also the destruction of the harlot religion in Revelation chapter 17 and chapter and, and uh, 18. So does this prove conclusively that Ezekiel 38 and 39 describe Armageddon? Nope, not yet. But the accounts have an interesting amount of overlap. And at the least, it should cause a serious Bible student, such as you or I, to read Ezekiel chapters 26 and 27 as part of your homework after this broadcast. So let's continue with Ezekiel 38 with verses 8 through 12. After many days thou shalt be visited in the later years, thou shalt come into thy land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Now these verses, 8 through 12, are very significant in helping us establish the timing of this Gog-Magog war and the invasion when it's going to happen, and here's why. Now verse 8 says this will happen in the latter years. That's consistent with scriptural terminology for the last seven years of human history, otherwise known as Daniel's 70th week 
and the days of Jacob's trouble. Um, consequently, the, uh, Jacob would be Israel. Verse 8 also speaks of the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. Now, there I know of folks who visited Israel, and uh, we see Perry Stone there all the time. Pastor Ken Billsborough went to Israel, but Perry Stone has commented uh, and has, has made uh, comments in his broadcast and on his uh, website that he saw the mountains near Megiddo and in the Golan Heights uh, and after the spring rains and the mountains might have been desolate in Ezekiel's day but they were beautiful during the trip they were on dotted with uh, with cultivated fruit trees and even banana plantations so the days of uh, of of plenty with Israel being blessed and growing are certainly in our time frame now Magog uh, according to this, these verses, uh, yeah, Magog will attack Israel after the people are brought back from the sword, gathered out of many people. And verse 12 echoes this by saying the Israelites are in their homeland after being gathered out of the nations. So God repeats himself to emphasize that this invasion did not happen at some remote time in the past, like after the Babylonian or the Assyrian Captivities, the only time Israel has ever been gathered out of a multiple nations and has been in our it's been in our lifetime since the nation was reborn in 1948. So we know that for a fact, any time forward from 48 onward to present day is when this prophecy of this invasion is going to take place. In Ezekiel's day, every major city was fortified with tall walls and massive gates. So he is amazed to describe the latter days Israel as the land of unwalled villages in verse 11. And so today, fortress walls are no defense against modern weapons, modern cities, including those in Israel today, and they can be described as unwalled villages. Part of those, the reason why the walls were left up around Israel anyway is just archaeological uh, 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 for antiquity purposes. But with modern day uh, weaponry, pff, there's nothing there to protect them except for Israel itself and, of course, the Lord God. Not only has Israel been gathered back to their land and the nation is prospering economically, uh, we got natural gas, we got oil, and we have the farming that's going on in Israel. Uh, Israeli farmers have gone into desolate places and turned them into lush farmlands and have become the major supplier of fresh fruits and vegetables to Europe. So Israeli scientists and engineers have developed many successful high-tech industries within Israel, and the Israeli government is now pondering ways to lure more college-trained immigrants from Europe and the USA to Israel. Another significant part of this Bible verse is that Israel was gathered uh, in their land, but they weren't conspicuously uh, prospering and qualifying for this battle uh, until, the, until the 1960s of course. And then since Iran, which is Persia, was a nominal ally and trading partner of the United States until the Shah was overthrown in 1979, this Magog alliance was not politically possible before then. And so now we see Russia Now we see Russia 2600 year prophecy aligned as a ally of Iran, and that's happened in our generation and this in our present time. That was huge when that took place. Uh, until recent times, Turkey had a pro-Western secular government, government and uh, uh, some time back, uh, several years ago, it was predicted that Turkey's secular government would be replaced by a more religious faction of Muslims before conditions would be ready for Turkey's participation in this invasion. And, of course, that transfer of power has happened since Erdogan has been made president. And did you notice the, the particular series of uprising Muslim countries in early 2011? Of course, in case you slept through the Arab, riot, the Arab Spring, a militant jihadist group called the Muslim Brotherhood organized a series of riots and anti-government protests in a string of nations in North Africa. And with the approval of the present White House and President Barack Obama, the Muslim Brotherhood took control of three governments and toppled the only pro-Western Muslim dictator in the region, which was President Mubarak of Egypt. 
So we see that was huge also. Although not widely reported here in the United States, the Muslim Brotherhood has well-defined goals. Uh, They have a goal of seeing the destruction of Israel, the establishment of Sharia or Muslim law over the entire world, and the reestablishment of the Muslim caliph as head of both the religious and political affairs of a soon-to-be Muslim world. And if you do some research, you'll discover that under the Sharia law, only the caliph is permitted to declare jihad. Of course, any nutcase can declare fatwa, but only the caliph can declare jihad. The obvious beneficiary of the Muslim Brotherhood's activities is Turkey, where the last caliph ruled until the office was abolished in 1924. So have you noticed that all of the nations in the Muslim world, Turkey has been relatively immune to unrest? Have you noticed that? Of course, until recently, when uh, uh, it's been, Turkey has been buying oil on the black market from ISIS, and of course then shooting down the Russian plane, and now the tension's incredibly high. Russia supplies an awful lot of goods to Turkey, and now there's talk of sanctions going against the nation of Turkey because of what they did. The key political alliances are now in place, and of course the battle, in my opinion, the battle could happen at any time. So verse 13 of Ezekiel 38 gives us some pretty interesting insights as we continue to go on and as this seems to as this seems to be uh, coming to fruition here that this is actually happening in our lifetime as we speak here. You got Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. This is Ezekiel verse 13 and chapter 38. With all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold and take away cattle and goods and take a great spoil? So here we also see that Sheba and Dedan represent the Arabian countries of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Kuwait, etc., who will, of course, be standing nervously on the sidelines. And the group Merchants of Tarshish, Sounds pretty much like the European community and the USA, which might be the young lions thereof. Note that there are neither participating; uh, they are neither participating in the invasion nor helping defend Israel. The Arabian countries, in particular, are aware that Iran has been less than stable in their quest to develop nuclear weapons, and in a way, the Arabians will be relieved that this nasty group isn't coming for them. But they know they that they're vulnerable. Now, we see it's based on uh, information that we've received that the invasion in Yemen was partly supported by Iran, which is right next door to Saudi Arabia. And we believe that there's going to be uh, tension and upheaval once again throughout the entire portion of the Middle East once it's gotten to a uh, kind of a melting pot. All the fingers are going to be pointing at Israel once it's said and done. We go to verses 14 through 17. And therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou, not, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land, and the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he whom I have spoken of in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? Now here, I'm reading from the King James Version Bible, of course. You might be American Standard Version or whatever version you've got that is approved to read that's that is translated from the King James Version. I want you to note that God takes this invasion personally in these these verses, 14 through 17. Now, he refers to Israel as my people in verses 14 and 16, and he speaks of it as my land in verse 16. And he speaks of my servants, the prophets, in verse 17. So it takes a special kind of, well, shall we say, stupid blindness (laughs) 
to attack the kids and the land of Almighty God. And this is basically what's happening. And, of course, they come in, and God allows them. He brings them in there. And in the rest of the passage also gives us this subtle hint about the timing of this invasion. Notice in verse 14 and verse 16 that God speaks of my people. Please, you've got to be very clear that my people means Israel in this passage. The Christian church has not replaced Israel in the heart and promises of God. The church of Jesus Christ is a temporary oddity, a peculiar people between the first and second comings of Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. By referring to Israel as my people, the Lord is speaking of the time prophesied in Hosea chapter 1, when Israel is restored to the land and ready to be identified as the people of the Lord. And so here, verses 14 through 17, what, why is God allowing and bringing these nations into this war against Israel, this invasion? Why is he doing it? He says this, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel, as a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So this is going to be an event that takes place, and that it, God does this intentionally, so that the unsaved world will realize that he is God. And it's a fulfillment of prophecy. God makes himself known to the heathen and to all of the enemies of Israel. God makes himself known to the world at this time. Pretty exciting. I mean, it's pretty exciting stuff. It really is. Uh, and then, of course, this is going to be a time where people uh, they are going to freak out. And this is why it's important. This implies that this event happens after the initial rapture of the Christians who are alive and awake. Uh, and with the Bible-believing Christians gone from the scene, the Jewish people will be without their most vocal allies. And another thought, if the invasion happens in the very near future and the United States armed forces are still commanded by uh, a president who, has raised, who was raised Muslim and has bowed to the Saudi king, the invading Muslim armies will think nobody will set up will step up to help Israel. And like I said, it takes a special kind of stupid blindness to call the God of Israel nobody. So like what President Obama has been doing, and we'll, we'll see how the, the end of how this is going to happen, I believe we're going to see some huge, huge event take place in December at the United Nations. And I believe Israel, the land of Israel is going to be um, attempted to be divided at this time. And the veto vote the United States uses will be rescinded. It will be pulled out. In recent years, the United States government has taken an unfortunate policy attitude towards Israel. Here, Barack Obama's administration has basically refused to, to support Israel and its plans to destroy Iran's nuclear weapon facilities. So then here uh, we see that uh, Iran has been given you know, the green light pretty much to do so with this latest uh, 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 treaty that Iran has been uh, involved with the United States. And uh, we know that uh, it's been an ongoing uh, administration policy uh, that President Obama has been trying to do to give, has given Israel a, a deadline to partition itself into two countries and give half of Jerusalem to, in, in Muslim control. And of course, the obvious implication is that if Israel doesn't destroy itself, the United States will solemnly pronounce Israel to be the obstacle to peace in the Middle East. It's already been doing it anyway. The rhetoric has really ramped up lately. If you read the news, uh, all fingers are pointing at Israel for pretty much everything. And it's apparent that the new, uh, the, these new allegations that we see from time to time that pop up, and it's apparent that the Obama administration, too, pretty much has already decided to take the side of God's enemies and all of this. That's why we believe that the attitude might explain a pretty mysterious passage that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at here later in the broadcast. But I want you to note that God is actually planning, see, 
planning and permitting this invasion for his glory. See, in verse 16 it says, And I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. So, like I said earlier, in other words, God will turn this whole event into an opportunity for the heathen, which could be, you know, your neighbors or anybody else who's watching who doesn't believe in God, anybody who's been watching the news, anybody who's watching the invasion take place to observe God's awesome and miraculous power. And how will his power be displayed? Well, here's how it will be displayed in verses 18 through 23. It tells us how. And it shall come to pass that at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in my fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain the great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. <laughs> so this is the reason God takes the opportunity to uh, pretty much say, Hey, uh, 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 I'm God, and uh, I want you to take notice. And uh, after I get done, I'm pretty sure you're going to, you're going you're gonna to understand that I'm God. So God will display his awesome power and his wrath, and he does it in many ways. He will cause a, a great shaking, perhaps an earthquake, in the land of Israel, severe enough to disturb even the birds and the fish. And the shaking may be centered in Israel, but its effects will impress people all over the world. If its shaking is strong enough, and it is in Israel, and this happens just after the rapture, then you can foresee the fact that if this is a shaking in Israel, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock will be shaken to the ground, making room for a third temple and an Antichrist. In verse 21, the Lord says, He will again confound the enemies of Israel so that they fight against themselves and destroy each other. And this is one of the Lord's trademarks. So what he's done he frequently used uh, this weapon against armies invading Israel, including at least twice uh, in, uh, in passages here. And God will plead his case with pestilence and with blood. And I'm not really sure what that means, but I'm, I'm, I'm very sure it will not be, it will not be pleasant. <laughs> God will send an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone against Gog and upon the many people that are with him. And uh, people have reported, uh, there's been video lately of large hailstones that have come through the rain in Israel, but not great hailstones. And the invading armies will be bombarded, first of all, with unprecedented weather, rain and miraculous hailstones. Then will come the fire and brimstone. Now there's a whole bunch of in the Golan Heights out there by where that oil was found in the northern parts of Israel, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, volcanoes that have been, uh, they've been asleep. Uh, and uh, perhaps they're going to be awakened. And then we also see that God will destroy the invading armies like he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with, with uh, fire and, and brimstone. And uh, and uh, so this maybe these uh, maybe these um, volcanoes that have been extinct or they're laying dormant come back to life and they shoot out uh, all kinds of fire and brimstone from them and lava they blow up and and uh, 
God will destroy the invading armies by them, like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. So one of the things that people think of and they talk about here in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is that they think and talk about the fact that, you know, that this passage teaches that there will be nuclear war. And so the passage that we're reading here itself is really not conclusive, but this passage definitely tells us that something with the devastating power of nuclear war will be unleashed against the invaders. You know, if it was fire and brimstone from desolate and dormant volcanoes, or if it's a nuclear explosion. And so later passages will tell us more. But for now, we'll rest assured that God doesn't need any help from earthly weapon, uh, earthly weapons or builders of earthly weapons to make this happen. He's able to torch, uh, you know, the invading armies on his own, just like he did Sodom and Gomorrah without a single man-made weapon. Now let's take a step back here and look at the entire prophetic picture. I mean, we know from the prophecies of Daniel that the last days dictator first gains fame by pretty much helping broker a treaty between Israel and the many, referred to as the many, and the last days dictator will most likely be a peacemaker, the Antichrist, arising from the general area previously ruled by the king of the north. And today that area is covered, of course, by Syria, Iraq, and parts of Lebanon, Iran, and Israel. And that terrible person could originate from any of those countries. Now, it is not likely that he will be a European unless his genetic ancestors are from the Middle East. And furthermore, the most likely time for the last day's dictator to broker or ratify this treaty between Israel and the surviving remnants of its enemies would be immediately following the invasion described in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. So let's make some speculation here. We're getting closer to the end part of where we can make a decision. And let's speculate for a little bit, okay? I've got, let's see, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got eight points I want to make in speculation in reference to what we've been talking about here. And scripture. All right. Number one, you know, Iran is presently behaving as the least rational country on earth. Um, we know that back when Ahmadinejad was president, he was calling for uh, the annihilation of Israel. We know the, the, the Ayatollah is still calling for the annihilation of Israel. A peace treaty was given to Iran. Not a peace treaty, but a nuclear treaty was given to Iran. And we see the convergence of the possibility, a very good possibility that that was done and it was done it, the whole world a lot of the if you're if you if you know bible prophecy it was done on purpose i mean the president had to be absolutely blind which he's not or was intentionally done to bring chaos to the middle east and so i believe it was intentional two at present there are, are dozens of of articles and newspapers, internet media about Iran's nuclear program, and this, the, it's kind of old news now, but it was really in the news here, uh, and and the repeated threats to launch nuclear war against Israel if they Iran get attacked. Um, in two thousand and nine, shortly after uh, uh, President Obama gave Iran until the end of the year to begin const constructive negotiations about its nuclear ambitions, Iran chose to shoot off some of its tactical missiles that could carry nuclear warheads. And on the same day that Iran's nuclear sponsor, North Korea, detonated a small nuclear device. So we can speculate that here it is now, 2015, six years later, and what advancements have been made. We know that North Korea has provided uh, detonating devices. Uh, Iran test, uh, tested a, a ballistic missile that could reach, uh, actually the, now can reach the west coast of California. At present, there are dozens of articles on the Internet speculating whether Israel will launch a preemptive strike against Iran's nuclear weapons program. Some of Israeli friends of mine say the question is, when and not whether the attack will happen. 
and whether or not this takeout strike is another possible provocation for the Magog invasion, and it could be. And if Israel was to do this, I believe uh, the United States government, President Obama, is always sticking his head right into the point where things seem to be getting out of hand or intelligence briefings, uh, information is gathered and they're hearing that Israel is saying, look, you know, we're not putting up with this no more. We're going to go ahead and start launching. And so right now, Israel is on the sitting on the hot seat is the cup of trembling. At various times in the past few years, there have been news stories about the oil ministers of the Muslim countries vowing to boost the price of oil skyward if Iran is attacked. Of course, uh, the clear message is that other Muslim countries are 100% supportive of the nuclear ambitions and hostile intentions of Iran, really all of them except Saudi Arabia because they know that uh, they would invade Saudi Arabia if they could and take them out. And then two U.S. presidents ago, uh, Russia, the chief military sponsor supplier of the Islamic terrorist nations, was brazenly talking about nuclear war in general. In the year 2000, 15 years ago, after President Clinton mildly scolded the Russians for bad behavior, a Russian spokesman replied, Mr. Clinton seems to forget that we are a mighty nuclear power. News reporters for European publications reported frequent episodes of open talk in the Russian parliament about the possibility of nuclear war. And, of course, in recent years, Russia has been outwardly quieter. But here lately, they've been pretty boastful about nuclear war, especially in defending themselves through Crimea, Ukraine, and now the Middle East. So God is putting hooks in their jaws. The Russians are all, are ready to rumble. And they were more respectful during President Bush's administration, but they maintained the world's largest nuclear weapons arsenal and a hostile attitude and here we are in 2015, and they're in the Middle East. <laughs> That's not, it's really not a good combination, folks, as far as reference for the world is concerned. It's an excellent combination to see this war begin to take place. So a few years ago, here all the way back in July 2008, Russian threatened military action against the Czech Republic, and the USA, became, because of the NATO-centric missile shield that the United States was trying to interpose between the Middle East and Europe, um, I think Russia probably was uh, had to be pretty concerned that their bully position, based on their overwhelming support, superiority of of uh, their nuclear weapons over Western Europe and the Middle East, pretty much was uh, endangered at the time. Uh. Well, perhaps this time the defense system might really work. You know, it's hard to maintain a bully position when the other kids figure out how to protect themselves. And Russia is becoming very anxious about the future and, and is more likely than usual to support military action, and this is what we've seen happen. Now, one of the things you may not know, I'll throw out there, is that there, there's like, there is a lot of Muslims in Russia, a lot of them. And recently, a uh, we put a broadcast of the Prophecy Watchers, Gary Stearman, his show, on Facebook with Avi Lipkam. And Avi was telling us at that time about how why Russia was in the Middle East. And the, the, there's a lot of Russians that have, deflect, that have defected from Russia that have joined ISIS and they're Muslims. And so at one time, these Muslims who've joined ISIS, uh, their generations have hated the Russian people. And so uh, it seems like this is kind of a all in the type family situation on the Muslim side from all the different types of countries where they're at. And these Muslims who are defecting from the countries that they're in are returning to the country that they want, and a caliph. So let's quit speculating. Let's move on to Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 1 through 5. Therefore thou, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn to you 
and turn you around and lead you on and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow, bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and, the, and all thy bands and the, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Now these verses here uh, are bracketed in the King James Version, thus saith the Lord in verse 1, and I quote, I have spoken it, saith the Lord in verse 5. So in other words, you need to pay attention to this because God is being very empathetic here. He's, God is talking about a real battle involving real people, don't buy any wishy-washy talk about this being symbolic language or describing the eventual triumph of good over evil, whatever they, somebody comes up with. Whenever you see God repeating himself for emphasis, you need to pay attention here. And note that God uh, repeats the names of Gog, Meshach, and Tubal, and he speaks of all thy bands and all the people that is with thee. These are real nations, and we know that they're presently being ruled by some really hateful individuals who hate Israel. So we need to pay special attention to verses 3 through 5. And I will smite thy bow out of thy hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. So note in verse 3, God declares, He will smite thy bow out of thy hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of the right, right hand. And since nobody fights with bows and arrows anymore, he's actually referring to modern weapons of warfare that fly through the air, like missiles. You can expect that the invading countries will launch an all-out attack against Israel using probably nuclear weapons. And a few might be made in Iran, but most have already been purchased from Russia or like Pakistan. But notice that God swats down the missiles. Once again, the timing is interesting. See here, in recent years, the United States and Israel co-developed a laser-based missile defense system capable of zapping the warheads of incoming missiles, rendering them relatively harmless. And without the trigger mechanisms, nuclear warheads are just heavy projectiles. They will make a thud and a big dent wherever they land, and they won't detonate. And remember, remember for this, uh, for later here in this, in this broadcast, I'll bring up this up again here. The leading edge of invaders will actually be allowed to get as far as Israeli soil, and that's going to be it. The scripture there. Uh, it reveals here to us that uh, they'll fall upon the mountains and upon the open field, and every vulture, jackal, wolf, and rodent in the Middle East will be invited to a gruesome feast. <laughs> so their weapons will be worthless to them. Their missiles will be zapped and neutralized en route. Their guns will be slapped out of their hands, and they might as well have brought pea shooters and spit wads. And note that the anti-missile defense system was co-developed by the United States and Israel and for the past several years, Israel has been, of course, actively deploying that system. Uh, they Iron Dome, they've been using it for quite some time. However, political obstacles have prevented deployment by the United States. And the new U.S. government is unlikely to pursue deployment of this system. Also, since it actually works, deployment of the system would be considered an act of provocation by the external enemies of this country and therefore unacceptable to the internal enemies of this country here in the United States in 2016. So verse 6 is very troubling in the view of the failure of the United States to deploy an anti-missile defense system because here the scripture refers to this as, and I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the coastlands and they shall know that I am the Lord. So what kind of fire is God talking about? And we can only speculate. We don't know for sure. 
and neither does anybody else in reference to this. But God has used fire and brimstone, whatever those are, or if it's been brimstone from a, a volcano, if it in, in, in older in biblical times it would have been volcanoes uh, to vaporize his enemies in the past. So this ver- this verse might describe a coincidental meteorite shower, a volcano, uh, since the damage is done to the invaders and their sympathizers, and not to the Israelites. And everyone would know that God had supernaturally arranged it. However, meteorites are not consistent with some verses we'll see later here in the chapter of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel 39, chapter 39, verse 6, might also describe what some contend to be nuclear war. So if Israel actually does give up some strategic lands, either, let's say, to Syria or to the Palestinian settlements, uh, they would they would not have really suitable high ground from which to base uh, on a counterattack or with conventional weapons, so they would be forced to use nuclear weapons. And the coastlands, the, these people who are in the coastlands, people that also they also get torched, or could that some have speculated that could be the United States? Well, maybe when this alliance comes against Israel. The Russians might launch a preemptive first strike against the United States also. And as noted earlier here on our broadcast, the Russians have openly boasted of launching a strike against us someday and for years have been building massive underground cities. And uh, uh, you can can do the research on that. Some of the cities that are in underground, just Google them. Uh, General info is, is very sobering in Moscow and Yemen too. Russian leaders believe their key industrial and government centers would survive a counterattack from the USA and a preemptive first strike against us would conveniently prevent our coming to help Israel. And to be honest, here we can only speculate. Uh, We know that uh, Russia has been flying over the last about five or six months. We've reported on uh, nuclear tipped and uh, uh, flights of their bombers off the coast of Alaska and also the coast of the United States on the West Coast. But in view of current events, um, these speculations are really too close for comfort, especially what's going on in the Middle East. And there's another factor you should be concerned about, even if you know the United States isn't directly bombed. The fallout from a nuclear battle, even on the other side of the world, would contaminate life all over the planet. And the bad news is that the normal wind patterns will carry nuclear debris everywhere. The good news is that you and your family can take steps to minimize the harmful effects of nuclear fallout if the attack should happen before um, the rapture. And we hoping that the Lord returns and takes us out of here, and then you won't have to worry about it anyway. A mutually destructive nuclear exchange would help explain another aspect of of end time prophecy. The book of Revelation is very clear that in the last days, power will be concentrated in the Middle East. And at the beginning of the last days, the United States will be staggered by the loss of between 5 to 10% of its population in the next rapture event. Some think it could be a little bit more than that. Others may think it might even be less. Regardless, likewise, China will be temporarily in shock from the disappearance of numbers of underground Christians, perhaps a larger percentage than the United States, China will be available for a push westward at the very end, and Russia and the United States are conspicuous by their absence from the book of Revelation. So their absence could be explained by a mutually destructive exchange. Verses 7, excuse me, verses 7 and 8 are important clues also to the timing of this invasion, the Gog and Magog war. Verse 7 and 8 says, "So so will I... So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people, Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord. God, this is the day whereof I have spoken. So God will use this event somehow. It's used to trigger a mighty, like a revival in the nation of Israel. And it's my personal opinion, too, that this will be 
the turning point spoken of by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11 and 25 and 26, where he says, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. And God uses nuclear missiles, or he supernaturally guides meteorites or volcanoes erupt. Something happens uh, where a majority of the people of Israel will suddenly rediscover the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, it's a significant number to them. Of them will also discover, you know, Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. And remember, you and I here are presently enjoying the time of the Gentiles when this mysterious period of history is complete in God's eyes, God will remove the present-day Gentile church so he can once again deal exclusively with the nation of Israel. And remember, just as a counterpoint here, the church did not exist in the Old Testament. And there was, there was references to a great gathering There's uh, in the book of Zephaniah. There's references to being hid from the time of indignation. There's always been references to a great gathering of the of the, the blowing of the shofar, but there was never a reference to the church. And of course, it was it didn't come into account until the book of Acts. But here we see that earlier that the the, the, the rapture might be one of the uh, could be one of the hooks in the jaw that God uses to draw Gog and his buddies into this invasion. So. You know, the rapture, we're not waiting for the rapture to happen as to trigger the events, but at the same time, it could be used as a an event that does trigger many things, Daniel's 70th week and um, the, the war of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And that, so let's go to verses 9, and six, 9 through 16 here in Ezekiel chapter 39, which this describes the scene after the brief uh, invasion that happens. And Ezekiel says, And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years, so that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the, of the sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there, shall, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude. And they shall call it the valley of Hamangog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them. And they, sh- and they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. So here, this sounds like a pretty stinky and gruesome scene. Uh, if we, we if, I mean, they're going to take seven months to bury the dead. This is, it's a very, it, and it's kind of curious. Also here, the Israelites will recover this astonishing amount of, of war material from the invaders. And then for seven years, it says they shall burn them with fire to supply their own domestic energy needs, perhaps. This might refer to like uh, to massive oil tankers and mobile tank trucks captured after the battle. Uh, you know, Chuck Missler, he suggested this passage might refer to captured nuclear weapons. Nuclear power plants can use mixed oxide material consisting of 7% weapons-grade plutonium with 93% regular uranium. And since reactor rods last several years, it's very conceivable that the the recovered plutonium would support up to seven years of fuel production. So Chuck kind of hits it on the the, the nail on the head there. Uh, There's a good possibility that that's what that might be and what that's referring to. And then there's more detail in verses 14 and 16, and it says, and, then the, and, they will, and they shall sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search, and the passengers that pass through the land, when, they, when any seeth a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it 
till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. And also the name of the city shall be Hamanah. Thus shall they cleanse the land. So according here to verse 14, the uh, the Israeli government will hire full-time uh, people, professionals, men of continual employment here to oversee the burial and the decontamination work. Sounds like the type of work needed after, you know, a nuclear war, or perhaps a biological or chemical warfare. And if it was a, a supernatural meteorite shower or a volcano, the rocks would fall and the corpses would be buried in the rubble. So then it would just take a few weeks of, of work with bulldozers and vultures to eat the remains and to deal with the mess. So instead, this cleanup <clears throat> and this verse 14 to 16 sounds kind of odd that a passerby or passers who pass by don't just bury what they find. They erect markers and let the and let the, the people who are the who are taking care of it carry the stuff away to a designated waste area. So it sounds like the remains will be maybe radioactive or even toxic. So let's skipping to verses seventeen through twenty. Let's read uh let's read verses twenty one and twenty two. And Ezekiel says, And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed in my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. Let me get a drink here. <clears throat> so God works this out. It's going to be conspicuous, kind of a conspicuous miracle. And of all the participants in the battle... Only Israel, the who was the intended victim here, will be left standing. Nothing subtle, really, about this. And according to verse 22, here the um, the the Jewish people will experience a massive spiritual awakening, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. And this makes me uh, makes me also think that this event happens at the very beginning of the tribulation period. So after this miraculous miraculous deliverance. The nation of Israel will be divided and uh, into two camps, and the religious worldly folk, or the heathen and the honest seekers for uh, for God, and the religious majority will believe that God favored them because uh, of their in, uh, in it superiority, and will become like the religious Pharisees of Jesus' day. But of course, by contrast, the honest seekers will discover that Jesus is Messiah really is described throughout their scriptures, and they will turn to him with all their heart. So we can ask the question here that after verses 21 and 22, we ask we can ask the question, why do you say that the worldly folks will be in the majority? Well, because other scriptures tell us that only one-third of the nation of Israel will escape to the wilderness, and the rest will be surprised at the last day's dictator and his betrayal to them. So, uh, and we also look at this and as we've gone through this, chapters 38 and 39, we could, uh, we could perhaps speculate and say, you know, couldn't these chapters just be another description of the battle of Armageddon? And that's, that's a possibility uh, that would certainly be pretty much a convenient explanation, but there's certain elements about Ezekiel 38 and 39 that does not fit with the description of the Battle of Armageddon, and here's why. Now, the Battle of, of Armageddon will be a gathering of all world's military might to resist the return of Christ, the Messiah of Israel. And so by contrast, Ezekiel describes an invasion of an independent nation of Israel. And as we know from other scriptures, notably the, the book of Daniel, the last day's dictator, the Antichrist, is gonna, he's going to seize control of Israel in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. And this invasion happens before Israel is betrayed by the beast. Secondly, we got Ezekiel's account of the battle. It does not include a description of the Messiah's return in the clouds of glory, neither does it described his immediate arrival in Jerusalem to establish his kingdom. So 
uh, these are huge clues here. Uh, the, in other Hebrew prophetic accounts of the day of the Lord, we see the Lord before, uh, during, and immediately after the devastation. And instead, here in Ezekiel, he spends verse after verse describing the toxic cleanup and how the nation of Israel begins its spiritual awakening. And then we know that God has specific objectives to accomplish by intervening in Magog's invasion. And those these objectives were different from his objectives of the Battle of Armageddon. God's objectives was to get the heathen and the world and Israel to realize that he is God. And, of course, in the Battle of Armageddon, Christ returns and destroys all the enemies with the brightness of his coming. So in the overall context of Bible prophecy, we know that the seven-year tribulation period, known as Daniel's 70th week, or the time of Jacob's trouble will be a time when God is specifically placing the nation Israel at the center of the world's attention. And this, uh, his miraculous intervention against this invasion would be you know, a suitable beginning. And as I, as I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, God will use this event as a spiritual wake-up call for the nation of Israel. And it would seem cruel if he permitted Israel to sleepwalk through the entire seven-year tribulation period, and at the very latest, uh, you know, this event might be at the midpoint of the seven-year, uh, the seven-year tribulation period, and the political alignments also are different. Uh, the account of Ezekiel sounds like how the alliances would, uh, from today, with Magog and Persia, Turkey and Iran as the primary instigators. And by contrast, the book of Revelation shows the last day's dictator as, as, and his aligned uh, kingdoms as central antagonists of the Battle of Armageddon and against, uh, to come against Israel. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, again, God will use the event as a spiritual wake-up call. Uh, we know from other studies that the last days, <clears throat> uh, the Antichrist will... We'll head a group of ten kingdoms, and he's going to uproot three of them. Uh, God's pounding of the invaders might enable him to uproot the three. I, mean, I really don't care which three, nor do I plan to, to be around, and I hope you're not, to find out. But hopefully you and I will be airlifted to safety and raptured out of here before then. Uh, and then we got the caliph, which is Gog, and Ezekiel's account would seem to be a secular Sunni caliph based in Turkey or in the Middle East like ISIS, and that person is likely to perish in God's response to the invasion. So the last day's dictator or the Antichrist is more likely to be a Shiite caliph, but this is all speculation right now. And, and in, our, <clears throat> in our, we did a study uh, also uh, here a few months back on the book of Revelation, and we talked about the seven seals, and we see that uh, that a quarter of the world's population is destroyed by war, famine, and disease during the first half of the tribulation period. And a nuclear exchange between the United States and Russia, coupled with the resulting toxic clouds of debris, would account for casualties of that magnitude, or even China. So, We can ask ourselves here, you know, are we ready to make a commitment on whether or not what we're seeing in the Middle East uh, uh, is truly the beginning stages of the Gog and Magog war? And we now, you know, we know that a, a numberless multitude will come to the saving knowledge of Christ and the Messiah of Israel uh, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. <clears throat> and these are people within in the Middle East. This is happening. Uh, the unbelieving, the unrejecting world, uh, all, all around the world, the Gentile nations, uh, because the truth was given to them, Scripture states that God will send them a strong delusion that they might be deceived and that they're blinded. After the alive and awake church has been airlifted to safety, the raptures occurred, uh, and... Uh, Unfortunately, this numberless multitude might not include very many United States residents living near strategic targets. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> you might be listening to this broadcast and wondering, 
you know, how long you can postpone a real commitment to Christ. And I can tell you that the answer is not very long because the fence might soon be radioactive that you're sitting on waiting to make your your commitment to Christ. If God judged Sodom and Gomorrah for their tolerance of false religions and sexual perversion, then he must judge this nation too here in the United States. So in I'm going to commit to you that I believe very strongly based on our study I believe very strongly uh, that we have the beginning stages of the Ezekiel 38 and 39 Gog and Magog war beginning to take place or take shape to take place and of course we know the rapture has to occur uh, before the actual all out uh, war uh, takes place, and so we're 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 so very close to that happening, and a lot of people are not they're not sure. You know, they they hear you may be listening to this broadcast, and you're not saved, you don't know Christ, and you're not sure of the scriptural basis of what I've been speaking of. You're not sure about your salvation. So, my question to you is: Are you trusted in Christ? or in your long-time membership in the whatever denomination you're going to, or what no denomination. And what about your children and your closest friends? Are you willing to gamble that they'll have seven years after the first rapture event that get things right with God, and wouldn't you rather spare them the grief? You know, it's our hope here in our ministry uh, is that you've already come to the saving knowledge of Christ and that you believe that he's the true Messiah of Israel. And if you aren't sure of your relationship with Jesus, then I, I, I beg you to I beg you to listen and I beg you to come to Christ now before it's too late. Uh, I truly believe truly believe that we have and have been entering a uh have been entering a very um uh, uh, it's it's folks i've not seen in my lifetime and have i and i've kept i've read things and i was maybe i was like some of you who don't know christ if you're listening to this and you haven't gotten saved i mean i've kept i kept track of things i looked and read things and i questioned things that i heard because of my upbringing but i never did make a real commitment to christ until i got saved and now that i've now that I've been saved since March 11th of 2008, I have not seen prophecy, Bible prophecy, I have not seen it come to pass at the alarming rate of speed that it's coming to pass, and I've not seen so much of it come to pass as we are now in this generation. And so, you know, we ask that you seriously consider coming to Christ, and seriously consider turning from sin and repenting of that sin and asking forgiveness of that sin and then accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior and then getting yourself educated and read the scriptures and study the scriptures. Time is of the utmost importance. We just, um, this study uh, concludes and it, I, 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 I can't help but believe in my in my heart of hearts that we're reaching we're reaching pivotal points of time where there'll be no turning back. And we're reaching pivotal points in time where one day, here very shortly, you know, the trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord with our loved ones and shall be with Christ and the Lord forever. Now the question I have for you is, is, are you going with us? And so seriously consider after this broadcast, you know, finding your prayer closet, getting by yourself on bended knee, on your knees, on your face before God and repent of your sin and come to Christ. My name is Mike Parker. 
This is Prophecies of the End Times Radio Ministry, a Fire of the Holy Ghost Broadcasting Network production. I hope you've enjoyed the broadcast. I hope you've learned from our study from the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39. And uh, I'll just leave you with a few things here at the end of our broadcast. Um, and uh, just to help you, if you've made a, if you've made a decision... And for those of you who are listening here that, um, that, you know, you've, uh, you want to know maybe a guide to the last day events, you know, here's some general guidelines based on, uh, the study that we've had at some point here in the near future, possibly on a Pentecost Sunday or on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets or whatever day it's going to be during a feast, maybe it's on near the harvest, the Lord will call his followers to heaven and give them and us, or give us all new resurrected bodies. That's the next event. Shortly after you and I are airlifted to safety, the last day's Antichrist or the dictator will facilitate a seven-year peace treaty between Israel and its hostile neighbors. Then we see the signing of this peace treaty. It will mark the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, as described in the prophecies of Daniel. And this week, or seven-year period, will be a time of God's specific dealings with the nation of Israel. So the church must be taken away just before or exactly at its beginning. And beginning then and continuing through the seven years will be the unfolding of of the judgments that we had taught and that uh, we, you can see beginning in the book of Revelation chapter 6 with the opening of the seven seals. Um, you have religious deception, you have wars and rumors of war, disease and famine, earthquakes and natural disasters, and martyrdom of Christian and Jewish people for their faith. Approximately one quarter of the world's population will be killed through these wars, disease, famine, earthquakes, religious persecution, and other disasters. And at some point, either just before or just after the start of the seven-year tribulation period, the war described in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 that we just went through will happen. And this will trigger the last day's spiritual awakening for the nation of Israel. Shortly after the start of the seven-year period, the Lord will put his seal on 144,000 Israeli-born Messianic Jewish men and these men will have a unique evangelistic ministry for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period before being given a private rapture to be with the Lord. And then through the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the last days Antichrist or the dictator will be a model of political correctness. He and his false prophet will appear to be angels of light helping to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. They will make great inspiring speeches, encouraging people of all races and religions to live in peace and love. Millions will thrill to hear them, buy their tapes, and spread their deceitful gospel. And in the middle of the tribulation period, the last days, the Antichrist will break the treaty with Israel, seize control of Jerusalem, defile the rebuilt temple, and go on a killing rampage to destroy the Jewish people. And a faithful remnant will escape to the wilderness, just like they did when the temple was destroyed back in 70 AD, and perhaps the rock city of Petra is where they'll go, just like they did back then. The breaking of the treaty will announce the beginning of the three and a half year period known as the Great Tribulation, and when the beast rises to power, the false prophet will force everybody to take the mark of the beast. This will probably be a forgery proof identification and electronic funds transfer system. Uh, you can see really the precursor of this mark in today's Islamic countries where jihadist demonstrators put marks on their foreheads as a mark of solidarity. And at the very start of the Great Tribulation, the Lord will raise up two witnesses who will prophesy for the entire three and a half years. They will call the shots for God, predicting the arrival of the trumpet judgments and calling plagues down on earth. And at the start of the Great Tribulation, the trumpet judgments will begin to fall upon the remaining inhabitants of the earth. These judgments will bring the type of devastation normally associated with nuclear war, and one-third of the earth's population will be destroyed. 
Shortly after the start of the Great Tribulation, midway through Daniel's 70th week, the Lord will call a, a rapture for a second group of believers. This, These will be people, both Jews and Gentiles, who come to the a saving knowledge of Jesus, the Messiah, during the first three and a half years of the Tribulation period. And these are called the, num- the numberless multitude, as we see in the lesson uh, that we've been talking about. And, of course, we talked about it in, in uh, the book of Daniel. We've talked about it in the book of Revelation. It's not referred, not really a rapture, but it's, some, it's an event like the rapture. And at some point, either at the start of some or sometime during the Great Tribulation, uh, the devil and his angels will be cast out of their places in heaven and be confined to the earth. He and his henchmen intend to persecute every Christian and Jewish person remaining on the planet make plans to be elsewhere before that happens. And when I say that where Satan is uh, and his angels will be cast out of their places in heaven, I'm not talking about in the heavenly uh, realms of where God is and where Christ is. Remember, Satan is the prince of the air, so he can meet God in the heavens, but he's not allowed to be in the heavens that God is in. And he's also was cast to earth, so he goes back and forth before God. Near the end of the Great Tribulation, our Lord will take a final harvest of believers who will stand tall in their faith and refuse to accept the mark of the beast, and these believers will be eternal celebrities in heaven as a reward for what the Apostle Paul describes as monetary light affliction. And by contrast to the believers just mentioned, the faint-hearted folks who take the mark of the beast will be a part of a different harvest, the grapes of wrath performed by a very grim reaper. At the end, let's see, at the end of the Great Tribulation, the two witnesses will finish their prophecy and the last day's dictator will kill them. Then after three and a half days, the Lord will resurrect the two men and give them a private rapture to heaven. At the end of the Great Tribulation, God will direct his angels to pour out the seven last plagues upon the stiff-necked survivors. The plagues signal the official start of the day of the Lord, and these plagues will set the stage for the Battle of Armageddon. And when the dust has settled, Christ will return to the earth to set up his kingdom, and a 1,000-year period often called the millennium, uh, the millennial reign of Christ, and you and I, If you're a born-again believer and a true believer of Christ, will return with him to participate in his government. Those are a guideline, and I'm not going to tell you that I'm. It's 100% uh, solid rock, but that's a guideline to the last day events. So, really, the very the very first event of the last day events, the things that we see culminating in the Middle East with is uh, with uh, Russia and Iran, the United States getting pulled in, ISIL and its caliph, uh, um, Psalms 83 taking shape. All these things are happening and they're becoming, uh, it's more clear to me today than it's ever been that uh, these things are happening on the basis of the fact that the, the, the rapture is very imminent. And so... Uh, if you're not a believer in the rapture, perhaps this study has uh, has cleared that up. Uh, if you still believe that the church has to go through the tribulation period, and we've given very specific uh, uh, reasons why the church will not be part of the tribulation period, the great tribulation period, uh, but we're not immune, of course, to persecution, even death and death by beheading or any other means for that matter, right up until that point. So, again, I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, there's a guideline that I forgot to give there at the end of the broadcast, but there's a guideline for you of what's happening and what will happen and what will continue to happen. And it should be enough for anybody who's straddling the fence in your Christian walk to say, I really need to get serious about God and give up the things that I'm doing and dedicate my time 
if you have a wife to your wife dedicate your time to your children and dealing and re- and raising them to understand the time that we live in and dedicating your time as a man of god to your lord and savior uh, you really need to make that decision today uh, we're said time is so very short so thank you so much for listening for downloading this uh pretty lengthy uh, podcast and uh, and study on the book of Ezekiel and where we are in the timeline with the Gog and Magog war. My name is Mike Parker. This has been a Fire of the Holy Ghost Broadcasting Network production. Thanks, folks. <laughs>